Okay, today it's just me. I'm going to talk about EMDR, and I'm also going to talk specifically about EMDR and its application to borderline personality disorder. I'm going to talk about the history, the treatment modality, the evidence, the science, the criticisms, the uh, how it integrates with borderline treatment, and a final word. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. This uh, episode is in response to an email from patron Megan. She wrote, I would love an episode on EMDR, specifically in its application for treating borderline personality disorder. I currently work as a CSI worker, paraprofessional, and I spend a ton of time in the car, so I can't get enough of the podcast. I'm also looking to start graduate school for counseling, and it was this podcast that got me interested in Antioch University. End quote. All right. Well, patron Megan, thanks for that. And uh, if you end up coming to Antioch, Seattle, hit me up, and uh, we'll get coffee and talk. Okay. So let's talk about EMDR. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. It's a mouthful. The history of EMDR, it was developed by Francine, Francine Shapiro, an American. Starting in the late 80s, around 1987, she noticed that when she thought about her own traumas, I believe she was sexually assaulted, her eyes moved in a rapid diagonal direction side to side. So she would look up and look back. You know, she'd look up and to the right, or I think, and then down and to the left, up and to the right, down and to the left, and, she, and her eyes moved back and forth. And she noticed that this eye movement back and forth while she thought about these traumas that she, that she had been through, she noticed that it seemed to help her recover from those terrible experiences. She had been through a trauma, and she had symptoms of PTSD afterwards that were, you know, distressing to her. And when she did this eye movement uh, behavior, along with remembering these events, it seemed to help her recover from these events and have her be less distressed about the memories and have less PTSD symptoms. Incidentally, later, uh, a fellow named John Grinder would later claim that he suggested the EMDR technique to Francine Shapiro. It seems that either John Grinder was either just trying to steal Francine Shapiro because EMDR from this point forward became very popular and either Dr. Grinder was like, Ooh, I could, you know, uh, get in on this action by claiming that I was the one who invented EMDR. So he either is just trying to grab fame or he actually did suggest it's unclear. It's just basically comes down between John Grinder's word and Francine, Francine Shapiro's word. And there's really no way to know. Either way, French, Francine Shapiro was the first to start really seriously um, investigating it and publishing about it. And she certainly made it famous. So she, after discovering this, she started doing uh, trials where she would test her treatment modality on people and found that this eye movement thing actually helped people to... Uh, recover from traumas. She further developed the treatment modality. And instead of just relying on this eye movement back and forth, she integrated other kinds of therapies, psychodynamic therapy, interpersonal, cognitive behavioral techniques, and other kinds of things. And so she, she integrated a lot of different types of therapy into what is called EMDR. A lot of people associate EMDR with just the, with the eye movements. But it's actually an integration of several established theories for trauma and, and adds the element of eye movement. In the beginning, it was used on a lot of war veterans and rape survivors. And later, it uh, began to be used with other kinds of clients as well. And I'll get more into that in a second. I remember when this first started becoming popular, I started my education in therapy when I went in the mid nineties in 95 and P and EMDR was, and incidentally PTSD as a, as a diagnosis were really coming into popularity at the time. It was a time when 
people really started to look at this thing called PTSD. It was no longer just for war veterans or people who had been through extreme war stress. It was something that lots of people were found to actually be suffering from. And EMDR was also the talk of the town. Everyone was talking about EMDR. I remember that. I didn't know much about it when I was first starting out. I didn't know anyone who practiced it. But, but anyway, it was at the time called like the snake oil of the 90s. <laughs> Everyone, a lot of people I knew anyway, talked about it like it was this ridiculous new therapy that was coming out that was just silly. I mean, how could eye movements back and forth do anything? That's ridiculous. It, it just completely throws everything that we know about therapy on its head. And so let's ignore it and make fun of it. And that's, that's what I remember from my circle anyway. So... Uh, but over time, uh, up until now, 2017, there's reportedly over 100,000 clinicians around the world who have been trained in EMDR. So it's really a popular treatment um, modality for trauma. Okay, so let's look at the treatment specifically. Incidentally, long story short, I've, uh, in the subsequent years upon my circle influencing me in the mid nineties to think of it as snake oil. I've come to see it as a legitimate form of therapy for trauma and no longer denigrate it. So, but I'll get more into that in a second. Okay. So treatment, what exactly is EMDR? Well, so as I describe this, I, I hope you understand how integrated it is. I hope it's clear by the time I get through this section, you understand that, uh, EMDR is not just eye movements. In fact, I would contend that the eye movement section, the eye movement component of this therapy is actually a, a kind of a small part of it. And in my estimation, if you did this, if you did EMDR and never actually did the eye movements, I would suspect that it would be at least somewhat effective, if not just as effective sometimes. Now, I know EMDR people would say that's ridiculous, but there are a lot of really helpful elements to EMDR that don't involve eye movements. So let's, let's get into that. So the first phase of therapy in EMDR is the therapist assesses the client history. There's, there's a you know, fairly robust assessment period before you even involve yourself in what would be the core treatment of EMDR. You're, you're doing a fair amount of assessment. The therapist also, you know, getting the client's history that sort of thing. The therapist also assess, assesses how ready the client is for this form of therapy. So in order to really assess whether or not the client's ready, the therapist really has to explain the entire technique from beginning to end to the client. And this can be confusing. I mean, explaining a full course of therapy to a client can take time, believe me. And whenever I involve myself, I should tell, you, I should tell everyone I'm not an EMDR clinician, but I do treat trauma quite often. And I have my own brand of exposure therapy that incorporates lots of different integrative elements that uh, I use with people. But, it's, but the main, the core of my treatment for PTSD has to do with what they call imaginal exposure, which is people talking about their experiences while being uh, instructed on how to reduce their distress so that they can be habituated to those memories. And uh, it's been found to be absolutely effective. EMDR has a lot of elements of that. But anyway, so there's, and so when I talk about the, th when, when I get people that have been traumatized and I introduce the idea that maybe we could do trauma therapy, because most people don't come to therapy to be recovered from trauma. Most people don't come to me and say, I need to recover from my trauma. What most people come to me and say is, I'm, I'm having trouble in my marriage, or I'm having trouble as a parent, or I'm, I'm having trouble with anxiety, or I'm having trouble with depression. And then I discover through investigating that they actually have PTSD and that their anxiety or their depression or their relationship problems are actually due to their trauma related syndrome. And so then I say, if you really, you know, we could talk about your anxiety and we can talk about your depression. We can talk about your relationships, which is all great. 
But if you really want to fix this for good, you could recover from your trauma and therefore no longer get triggered, which will make it so you no longer get anxious and no longer feel depressed about your anxiety, no longer react with anger towards your spouse. And then people say, wow, that sounds good. And then I say, okay, well, let me explain the entire course. And, and I, uh, because the thing for people who have been through traumas is you don't want to just forge ahead without them knowing where you're going. Because if you just forge ahead fast, you can re-traumatize them and their, their dissociative mechanisms or their distress PTSD mechanisms can kick in and actually make them traumatized by the therapy itself. So, so EMDR incorporates that as well in terms of explaining exactly what the therapy is and making sure that the client is on board and that they're ready to start. Now, some clients at this phase might say to the EMDR therapist, whoa, 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 I, I don't think I'm ready for that. And so the EMDR therapist will say, okay, well, there are other kinds of therapy that we can do that might not be as challenging to you. We, and we can talk about that, or I can refer you to someone else, or you could come back when you're ready or something like that. So that's a very important phase of any kind of trauma treatment is really making sure that the client is consenting to the steps ahead. The next uh, step in terms of EMDR, the treatment uh, progression, is developing a treatment plan. In other words, you and the client collabor collaboratively come up with exactly what treatment's going to look like and, and how long it might take, generally speaking, and uh, what are the different steps. So you develop that plan. The next thing you need to do is, so at this point, the client's on board, they know what they're getting into, they're ready to go, the plan is in place. The, the very first thing you do after that is you need to develop a relationship. And you really you need to be doing that from the beginning. So this isn't something you just begin after the treatment plan, but it's something you need to establish up front. I, empirical evidence shows that everything depends on the relationship. It's one of the most helpful factors when it comes to outcomes in therapy. And it is the foundation of everything that happens in therapy. Therapy can be a very challenging thing for people. And unless the client really trusts you and likes you and believes that you're on their side and, and believes that, you know, you're listening to them, then when the therapy becomes challenged by what it will inevitably become challenged by, the client will just run away or they'll feel betrayed by you or they'll feel like you're not really helping them. And so you really have to make sure you develop that relationship. And that's something that I see at least some people not paying enough attention to. It's extremely important. And uh, so that's a part of EMDR. And I'm glad that EMDR recognizes that. The next thing that EMDR therapists will get involved in is helping the client develop skills to reduce distress, the, the distress associated with, with recalling the trauma. So in future phases of EMDR, the client is going to be instructed to remember the traumatic events. And this is going to produce a tremendous amount of distress for the client. The client is going to cry or tense up or feel extremely anxious or dissociate or uh, have sweaty palms or feel like a deer in headlights or be afraid or, or all of the above. And in order to cope with that future phase of therapy, the client in EMDR therapy needs to be able to regulate their emotions when it comes to distress. And so before recalling the traumas at all, we work on how to regulate that emotion. So I'll tell you, EMDR therapy and my brand of trauma therapy, even though I don't use eye movements, is exactly the same up until this point. <laughs> Everything that I've said so far is exactly the same thing that I do with people and I don't use eye movements. So I just want to point that out. So we haven't, again, we haven't even gotten to the eye movement part yet. The next thing that EMDR therapy involves is the client begins to just, now, again, the client by now has very strong skills of reducing their distress. And this isn't just like, 
hey, uh, deep breathing. That you know, it's weeks and weeks of trial and error, and practice makes perfect. In which the client um, comes into therapy and says, "I was triggered, and I had uh, I had five different techniques that I used, and four of them worked, and and I'm getting really good at being able to lower my distress level." So, it's not only just teaching skills, but it's also collaboratively helping the client to develop their own skills and then practicing them over and over and over again. This is very important because you can tell someone, yeah, deep breathe, but that's a far cry from mastery of being able to lower your distress level. Okay. So after that, in EMDR, the client describes the traumas that they went through and they're instructed to feel the feelings, the emotions, the bodily sensations. So the client is now at one of the core parts of EMDR or any kind of trauma therapy in which they're describing the things that happened. I was on a date with this guy and we had a couple of drinks and we went back and I was in his car and he, you know, blah, 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 blah. So as the person tells that story, they're getting distressed. They're being triggered. And the, but with the client and the therapist working together, they use those skills to reduce their distress over time so that it's not re-traumatizing. And the therapist is listening empathically and taking note of everything that's being said. Having said that, some EMDR sessions don't involve people actually talking explicitly about the traumas that they went through. It just depends on what the client wants to do. The main thing is that the client is thinking about the traumatic event, not that the client talks about it. So the client could just say, well, my traumatic event involves this one night I went on a date with this one guy. And if the client doesn't feel like talking in more detail about it. The therapist doesn't force the issue. The therapist says, okay, so that's the traumatic event that we're going to work on. And so the therapist might not ever really know what the traumatic event entailed. It's just important that the client think about it while the reprocessing occurs with the eye movements later on in therapy. The other thing is, is that I'm emphasizing pretty heavily a certain angle of EMDR because it's close to the way that I would operate. And I'm guessing it's the way that EMDR people would operate as well, but I'm not entirely sure. So, you know, take what I'm saying with a little bit of a grain of salt, but I, I hope you get the general gist of EMDR treatment. If a EMDR trainer were to train you on EMDR, I'm positive they would have more detail, uh, more nuance, more specificity. So just take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. And for you internet people that love to blast me on anything that I do slightly wrong, um, you know, feel free to send me a message, but just remember that I have feelings. Okay, so we need to take a break and when we get back, we'll talk about more of the theory and the treatment. <music> All right, we're back. We're back. Before I go go on, before I continue, um, just know that if you haven't already, please become a patron of the podcast. When you become a patron, you get access to the premium feed that doesn't have any advertisements, and also has a number of episodes that are just for patrons of the podcast. So become a patron by going to patreon.com. Go to patreon.com. Become a patron. Okay. So so again. We're at the phase of treatment where the client has very good skills in terms of reducing their distress, and now they're talking about their traumas in therapy, and they're feeling all those distressful feelings while the therapist listens empathically, and the client uses their distress management techniques to be able to lower their distress level. The client is also instructed to talk about the negative automatic thoughts that come up when they talk about this memory. You know, things like, I deserved it, or it was my fault, or I, I should have fought back, 
or you know, some other kind of negative thing, or this means that I'm a broken person. And so the client is instructed to name those negative cognitions that are associated with that memory. As they talk about these, these difficult times, the therapist might say, so what, what thoughts come up for you as you talk about this? You know, well, I, I feel like when I talk, I'm ashamed. I feel like I'm a terrible person. Okay, I'm a terrible, that's, that's one of the thoughts that come up for you when you, you know. And so you're, you're trying to name those, those automatic thoughts. I don't think EMDR calls them automatic thoughts, but that's basically what they are. And you also talk about the feelings. What are they, describe the emotions you're feeling. Describe the bodily sensations you're feeling. So there's lots of, there's lots of discussion around that. There's lots of empathy around that. There's lots of exploration. And so, again, at this point, this is all exactly the same sort of trauma therapy that I use. There's no eye movements yet. So by now, you're, you're potentially months into therapy. You might only be three sessions into therapy, but depending on how entrenched the trauma is, it could be a while before you actually get to this phase. And so, uh, so yeah. Uh, the next phase, the client focuses on these memories. So the client is now, again, talking about the tra- traumatic memories. But this time, the therapist involves my eye movement going back and forth. And the typical way that this is done is the therapist says, okay, I want you to remember uh, these memories, but I don't want you to talk about them. I just want you to think about it. Just think about, we've already talked about it, but now I just want you to think about those memories of your traumas or one particular trauma memory. I want you to feel the feelings. I want you to have the thoughts in your head, like the shame and all that kind of stuff. While looking at my fingers and I'm going to move my hand back and forth, before your eyes and I want you to follow my fingers and the therapist moves their hand back and forth fairly rapidly often in demonstrations that I've seen it's about a half second every swipe if that makes any sense so it's so if if I'm starting on the left I go you know I go left right left right left right left right so it's pretty fast it's not like left right, you know, it's, it's left, right, left, right. And so the client is, is thinking about these traumatic memories, feeling the feelings, feeling the distress, deep breathing, trying to, you know, stay relaxed while their eyes are, are moving back and forth pretty fast. Now there are other ways of getting them to be stimulated, so to speak, in terms of back and forth. You can use a wand uh, a wand would be easier, frankly, because eventually your arm would get pretty tired. My guess would be by the end, of, if you did EMDR with all your clients, you know, you'd, you'd be pretty buff in your arm by the end of the day. So uh, a wand with a little, you know, tip at the end for them to focus on would be easier. Sometimes people will use like a, a light thing. It's just like a dedic. It's like a, a light that goes back and forth, electronic light. Some people will who are blind they will tap the hands you know the therapist will tap their hands left right left right sometimes they'll use auditory stimulation so there'll be like a a beeping noise that'll go back and forth so it doesn't have to be your eyes moving back and forth it just has to be stimulation of the brain left and right left and right left and right and and it they all seem to work so after a while and you do that for a while in session, you know, focus on that memory, feel the feelings, have the thoughts. I'm going to move my, follow my finger as I move it back and forth. And then after a while, the therapist is trained enough to kind of know when to do this. But after a while, the therapist then asks the client and stops them and says, okay, what are you thinking about now? What are your feelings? What are the images you have? What are you feeling in your body? And these conversations can take a while too. And then when they talk about 
where they're at at that point, they might say, well, now I'm no longer feeling ashamed. I'm feeling angry about what happened. And I'm no longer thinking about that first memory, but I'm thinking about my parents and how they neglected me as kids. Okay, let's think, let's focus on that one because that has emerged for you. And now I want you to follow my fingers back and forth and fo- focus on that new uh, set of thoughts and feelings and bodily sensations. And I'm going to move my hand back. And, and, and you do that, you just repeat that process over and over and over again. And you're uh, eventually the client, if things are going well, will no longer feel the intense distress upon remembering the traumatic events. That's the whole point. And along the way, the therapist then instructs the client to, while you're thinking about the trauma, let's think about a positive cognition. Let's replace the negative thoughts and feelings with a positive thought and feeling. So it's, it's, it's sort of like meaning making, you know, like, okay, you were sexually assaulted and your initial automatic thought was shame. I was to blame. I should have fought back. It was my fault. Well, now that we've, you know, progressed through therapy, what's a, what's a different thought that you can have about, I'm not really demonstrating this. I'm sort of speeding through this, but my point is, is that you work collaboratively with the client to come up with some other positive connotation to that memory. One that could be, I'm a strong person because I survived, or I am the sort of person who, who knows how to survive difficult situations or, you know, some kind of, some kind of cognition that is positive. And so then you ask them to really concentrate on, on those thoughts. So you're trying to, you're trying to find meaning out of trauma. You're trying to find something positive you can say about yourself and you're trying to reduce the negative voices that you have about what you went through. EMDR therapists might ask clients to journal in between sessions. They might, they often will ask clients to rate their distress level and their emotional levels their triggers and their symptoms as a way of not only just getting a description of how, what their experience is, but also to monitor whether or not therapy is working over time. Because presumably when they come into therapy, their distress ranges should be higher than in the beginning, than when therapy ends, right? And the therapist knows that therapy has come to an end, at least the EMDR course of therapy has come to an end when the traumatic memories no longer cause any distress. And for some EMDR people, they'll say they can do this entire course in two or three sessions. And they'll also say it could take months, you know, maybe years, depending on the situation. But the whole idea is that it's supposed to be quicker than other forms of therapy. Okay. Again, let's review. So the therapist assesses, they assess, you know, the client just in general, they assess whether or not the client's ready, they explain how the therapy works, develop a treatment plan, develop relationship, and then you start helping the client develop skills in terms of reducing their distress level, emotional regulation skills. This takes a while, right? Then the client starts talking about the traumas while reducing their distress over time in the session. No eye movements yet. The client's talking about it. Client's talking about it. Automatic thoughts are identified. This could take a long time. There could be a lot of emotion during this time, a lot of distress. Then the eye movement stuff is the next phase where the client focuses on these memories and has these feelings and has these negative thoughts about themselves while doing the eye movement. And you keep doing that and you switch from memory to memory each time trying to process these memories so that they no longer hold power in the psyche. And you know that you're done when the client says they have, uh, they don't have PTSD anymore, (laughs) uh, meaning that they don't meet criteria for the diagnosis, or they say that the memories no longer cause them any distress. Okay. Now, again, I'm not an EMDR therapist, so I might be getting some of this a little wrong, but uh, from what I understand, that's the gist of it. Now, again, I just want to harp on this point that aside from the eye movement section 
which is in my mind a uh, just a percentage of this treatment aside from the eye movement section this is in general the exact same thing that i do i, I do everything in here except i might not describe it in the way emdr people describe it but in essence i'm doing the same thing i'm just i just don't involve the eye movement part of it and so uh, i think that needs to be uh, emphasized because in my experience a lot of people just think emdr is just eye movements but as you can clearly see it involves a lot of different steps that have nothing to do with eye movement okay so what does the research show well there's been a lot of research on emdr and it's pretty clear to me and to many in the field that EMDR is absolutely an effective treatment modality for, for trauma and maybe even for other kinds of things like borderline or anxiety or depression. And, and so it should be known that EMDR is solidly supported by empir lots of empirical evidence. So uh, that should be noted. The main thing you'll hear proponents of EMDR say is that not only is it effective, but it's, but it's much faster than other forms of therapy. That's kind of its marketing in some ways uh, that I, I tend to get from people is they'll say, sure, there are other kinds of therapies like exposure that will work, but EMDR is much faster. And there's some evidence that, that suggests that, but it's unclear to me when you look at the full breadth of research, whether or not that's accurate or not. Certainly, it in some situations it could be fa it could be faster. With some clients, I could imagine it being faster, but I, in some clients, I could imagine it being slower. And so, it it the evidence shows it's effective, but evidence shows there are other effective treatments as well. So that should be kept in mind. Also, it doesn't work for everyone. Empirical science shows that. It's, it's not 100% effective with everybody. And also, it should be noted that EMDR isn't easy. I think sometimes the way that it's described to people is that, well, you just move your eyes back and forth, and then you're cured. <laughs> and as you can see by the you know, full description of the treatment course, is it's a lot of hard work. You're, you're, you're in a lot of distress. It's not easy. It's like any of the, of the other trauma therapies, you, you, you experience the trauma again. It's not fun and games. It's, it's, you know, there's no pain, no gain when it comes to this sort of thing. It's a lot of hard work. Well, what does the science say when it comes to the actual physiological mechanism? You know, why does eye movements or stimulating the brain left and right, back and forth, why, why does this work? Well, after reading all the research that I could get my hands on and after knowing what I know about the brain in other arenas, the thing that I'll say is no one knows why eye movements work for people. No one knows why this bilateral um, stimulation, if that's the word, I think it's bilateral. Anyway, no one knows why EMDR works. No one knows why the eye movement stuff works. I think we can all surmise why the rest of the EMDR components work. You know, we, we know that habituation is a thing. We know that relationship building is a thing. And so, but, but we don't know why the eye movement thing works. You'll hear various unsupported claims from people regarding why it works. You'll hear people use like, it's, <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. I'm, 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 I'm not a, uh, you know, biologist or a brain specialist. And so, um, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt to some extent, but I know enough about the brain to know when people are using a bunch of uh, brain jargon to sound smart and to sound like they know what they're talking about. Um, I, and I, when I hear proponents of EMDR talk about why it works and they use you know all these like this language and stuff it, it to the lay person i can imagine it being very convincing but to people who understand the brain i imagine it they roll their eyes pretty hard you'll hear people say that it has to do with rem sleep or something rapid eye movement sleep and anyone who knows anything about the brain knows that the these hypotheses are just initial speculations 
Uh, I mean, we don't really even understand how the brain works. And we definitely don't understand why we have rapid eye movements during sleep. So how in the world would we understand how EMDR works? And that, that's the, that, there's this big myth that I th is, I think, upheld by society and the media and maybe even biologists in their attempt to come across as, as relevant. There's this big myth that we understand the brain. And we, understand, we've, we learn new things about the brain every day. But the basic mechanics of the brain is a complete mystery to us. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, we're a long ways off from being able to even measure what's happening in the brain, let alone know what we're measuring. So the long and the short of it is we just don't know. We don't know. There's theories, but there's not an easy way to test these hypotheses because we just don't have the technologies to, or the theory of the brain to really even understand uh, anything about the brain. So, so it's a bit of a mystery. And what some people will say is that it's, it's, um, there, it's not doing anything. You know, so let me get into the criticism. But before going into this, before going into the criticisms, I just want to pause and say that I like EMDR. I'm a friend to EMDR. It's a wonderful therapy. I don't use it, but I know it to be great. It's not perfect. There are other effective treatments for trauma, but EMDR is absolutely an effective, wonderful treatment for trauma. I have to say that because there are acolytes of EMDR that will attack me whenever I say anything negative about it. And so I just want to say that before I go into the criticisms, criticisms. but before I even do that, I need to take a break. So let's do that. All right, we're back. So let's get into some of the criticisms. There's been a lot of angry debate about EMDR over the years. If you're in the field, you've probably sensed that, or you probably, you know, some of you may even be fully entrenched in that. Um, and for those of you who aren't in the field, you probably have no idea about it, but there's a lot of fighting that goes on between different camps in psychotherapy. And EMDR is one of those camps that just gets a lot of flack for stuff. Uh, basically, the main criticism that it has been getting from the beginning is that, as you can see from the entire therapy, the eye movement component is actually, could be argued it's a small component of the overall therapy. And what a lot of people will say is that EMDR is bullshit because it's, a, it's basically exposure therapy with this eye movement thing added on. And of course, EMDR people will say that that argument is bullshit, but I'm just presenting to you what people will say. I'm not saying that I'm saying that, but that's what other people will say. Um, many researchers, many authors will claim this, that look, that, you know, this eye movement thing is just snake oil. The reason why EMDR works is because it, it incorporates evidence-based therapies uh, that have already been established as working and that just throws in this eye movement thing. Now, I will say that there is some evidence that suggests that the eye movement component is a critical component of the treatment. So they've tried to isolate that eye movement component to see if the eye movement component, it, you know, is it, is it actually an important factor to EMDR. And some studies show that it is an important factor to EMDR. On the other hand, other studies will show that it's not important to, uh, to uh, the overall treatment. There are, there are some studies that say that EMDR is more effective than exposure and other therapies. There are other studies that show that EMDR is less effective than exposure. So there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of debate, a lot of different studies, and a lot of different claims, and a lot of fighting. <laughs> Again, according to research, 
EMDR is an effective therapy and it's one of the effective options for people who have been traumatized and I fully endorse it as a therapeutic method. I'm just presenting the, the criticisms. I'm not attacking anyone personally. <laughs> um, another criticism is something that I haven't read. It's just my own criticism of EMDR, not of, of the treatment, but of the culture that kind of surrounds EMDR is that trauma is a scary thing for starting out clinicians, people who are just starting out in the field. When they come across traumatized clients and they experience PTSD or dissociation in their office, it's, it's a scary thing to witness. It's, 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 a, it's overwhelming. And I've seen anxious novice therapists who, who don't know how to you know, treat trauma. They turn to EMDR as this magic bullet for you know, it's like, oh, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, I'll, I'll run to EMDR and they'll save me. And there's nothing wrong with seeking EMDR training, but I find that for some reason in the culture of psychotherapy, EMDR is the go-to thing for novice therapists. And, and what I try to do with my supervisees is, is I will absolutely say, yeah, go for it, EMDR. If you go in that direction, you can't lose. But there are other options to, available to you. You don't have to go that direction if you don't want to. And so it's just one of the little things that kind of bugs me about it. It's similar to the way that when it, whenever people in certain consultation contexts, when people bring up borderline personality disorder, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, is often the only thing that's identified. It's like, oh, you have someone who's borderline, send them to DBT. That's the only thing that works. It's evidence-based. But the fact is, is that there are plenty of other, other evidence-based therapies that aren't DBT. But for whatever reason, you say borderline, people say DBT. You say trauma, they say EMDR. And although, like I said, EMDR is absolutely effective and you can't really go, uh, you can't have a worse uh, you, you, it's a good bet to go with the MDR when someone's traumatized, but it's not the only option is the thing. <laughs> anyway. Also, another criticism is, uh, this is just for me, is that it has a kind of cult following similar to Erickson. I, I talk about this sometimes on the podcast. There are certain things, certain topics in psychotherapy or, or in culture that when I talk about it, I'll get a hundred times more h hateful emails from people. It's weird, you know, as a podcaster, I think I do about, you know, three or four episodes a week. That's like, and each episode is probably an hour ish. I, I am, think about if you just tallied every stupid thing I said throughout the week, you know, you just sort of tally every, everything I spouted out of my, out of my pie hole. Think about all the things I said. Well, there are many things that I don't get a single email over, but there are certain hot button issues that if you talk about it at all, you're going to get angry emails from one side or the other. And EMDR is one of those things. If you talk about EMDR, I'd guarantee you after this episode, someone's going to blast me. Uh, I worry that a lot of people are going to blast me actually um, because there are certain topics like behaviorism. When I talk about behaviorism, I get like these sudden, you know, spurt of emails. There's a certain cult following in certain pockets of psychotherapy. Now, the thing that I'll say to anyone who feels like I'm talking about you is any form of therapy needs to be able to withstand criticism. Every form of therapy is worthy of critique. And every form of therapy is worthy of questioning. If we don't question it, then we're just dogmatically following, you know, something that we're not looking at critically. We should, we should be looking at things critically. Now, at a certain point, you can be bogged down in critique and never actually move forward, which I've seen before, believe me. But some critique should be leveled against everything. Some critique should be leveled against my critique, you know, and that's fine. But I've seen people get extremely close-minded when they fall in love with a particular form of therapy. 
I love all forms of therapy. I love EMDR. I love DBT. I love cognitive therapy. I love behavioral therapy. I love behaviorism. I love cog- cognitivism. I love psychodynamic therapy. I love psychoanalysis. I love interpersonal. I love humanistic. Oh, all the humanistic therapies. They're so great. I love them all. And, uh, but one of the things uh, that happens when you love them all is you kind of incorporate the critiques that each school has about each other. <laughs> and so I, uh, I've absorbed all the various critiques of all the different schools. And so, um, <laughs> anyway, so my critique of EMDR is that it sometimes is a cult following that has nothing to do with the model, and that has hopefully nothing to do with Francine Shapiro, and has more to do, I think, he, here's my theory, is that EMDR emerged as some kind of like uh, strange theory, strange therapy that that was working. And if it, if it didn't involve eye movements, people would have accepted it much more readily. But because it involved eye movements, which seems so strange to the rest of the psychotherapeutic world, there was just an immediate backlash where people, without giving EMDR a chance, they just started attacking it. I, I think I kind of remember this in the 90s. There was this immediate attacking of EMDR. Well, then all those EMDR people were like, why are you attacking us? We're just researching this thing. It's working and it involves eye movements, big deal. And so these two factions kind of went back and forth for a long time. And so there's, uh, there's been a lot of fighting. And when you have two sides fighting like Democrats and Republicans, people tend to dig in on their dogma. You know, they tend to really, you know, silo themselves in their camps and, and any statement from the other side is taken as ridiculous, right? So when I provide a critique of EMDR, it is perceived by the EMDR people that I am one of those people who is just like prejudiced against EMDR. And I'm here to tell you, I am not. EMDR is a wonderful therapy. It should be used for people with trauma. If EMDR was the only therapy for trauma, the world would be a better place. It's fine. It's a wonderful therapy. Uh, okay. Now, the patron wanted to me to talk about EMDR and borderline. Patron Megan. Okay. So, well, it depends on what we mean by borderline personality disorder. To, to some people, borderline personality disorder is a broad category that includes highly pathological people and... Uh, moderately to low pathological people. And some people, when you say borderline, they, they think you're only referring to the highly pathological individuals. So it really just depends. But the, the bottom line is that borderline personality is often associated with complex trauma. Complex trauma is being repeatedly traumatized often by someone in your own family. So if you're physically abused or neglected by your parents or you're sexually abused by one of your parents, then this, this constitutes complex trauma. Simple trauma is something that happened, you know, generally once, like you were in a car accident and that was traumatic for you. It was scary. It was terrifying. And you have PTSD afterwards because you can't get into a car and that's simple trauma. So complex trauma has attachment and relationships and, self-esteem all balled up into the trauma. And so borderline is often associated with complex trauma. And since EMDR treats trauma, EMDR could be effective to help people with those traumas. I can absolutely see how EMDR could provide a very clinical treatment modality for people with borderline. You know, there's a, I think one of the benefits of EMDR is when you describe it to people it, it might, it, for some people, it might sound much more attractive than more traditional therapy. You know, some people when it's like, so what, I'm just going to sit in a room and talk about my feelings. You know, for some people that just dry, that just is very unappealing to them. But when you say to people, there's this, there's this new kind of therapy that involves eye movements back and forth. For some people that might really appeal to them because it, it appeals to their kind of medicalized understanding of the brain. 
And I think that that can actually not only help attract people to therapy, but it can also treat outcomes because when you believe in the therapy, it tends to work. It's, it's more likely to work. And so I think that um, for people who have borderline, they might have an easier time accepting the idea of an eye movement therapy than a, than a talk therapy. I don't know, just a thought. Also, Marsha Linehan here at the University of Washington, expert in DBT and borderline, she suggests that exposure therapy, the kind of therapy that I do for people, she suggests that exposure therapy be used in conjunction with DBT when the patient suffers from PTSD in addition to borderline. So she'll get someone with borderline and PTSD and she'll say, well, let's do DBT, but we also need to help her recover from her trauma. So let's send her to another therapist to do exposure therapy. Well, Francine Shapiro has written that, you know, well, hey, if Linehan suggests exposure therapy as an adjunct to DBT, then surely EMDR would be indicated too, since EMDR is, is effective as well as exposure. So, and I agree with that, you know, it, it makes sense that if someone with borderline uh, has been traumatized and suffers from trauma symptoms, which they usually are, then EMDR and or exposure therapy would be indicated. Having said that, I, I can also imagine that the, if you really ran the course of the EMDR therapy with someone who had mild to moderate borderline, I could see the EMDR being the only thing that was needed. Because it has all the elements, it has many of the core elements that are really helpful for people with borderline personality. Emotional regulation, it has a, a component of that. Exploration has a component of that. Relationship, which is, of course, the central feature to healing the uh, traumas and the wounds that re result in borderline personality. Having a stable attachment with your therapist, you know? So I, and then, and then talking about traumas and then having empathy, getting empathy from your therapist. So I can absolutely see EMDR being helpful for people with borderline. Having said that, borderline is a complicated thing. And if you followed EMDR rather rigidly, I would imagine that it wouldn't be the best thing for someone that had moderate or severe borderline. You, borderline is one of the most difficult things to treat. Ask any therapist out there, and they'll tell you that's true. So there's really no easy answer to the treatment of borderline. It really requires a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom, a lot of consultation, a lot of education, and uh, a lot of flexibility, I think. A lot of self-care. <laughs> and so uh, to say that EMDR is great for borderline is a bit of a simplistic statement. But yeah, I could see it being used for sure. Okay, what's the final word? The final word is that it works. EMDR works. It carries a certain weight to it in our culture. So people might have more confidence in it. I think DBT is similar to this. When you say, uh, you know, EMDR to someone, they're like, oh, and they Google it. And there's all these like pro EMDR articles on the internet. Having confidence in your therapy is a big thing. And it can help you to feel confident in your course of therapy. And it, and it might also just invigorate you to, you know, give you hope for the future. And so in some ways, the cult following and the, and the, the propaganda, shall we say, it, it might actually be a good thing for clients. So I, I think that's definitely a pro. And the other, probably the most important pro to EMDR is EMDR is way better than the therapy that people often get for their traumas. The typical person, anecdotally, uh, of course, that gets treatment for trauma is actually not being served well by their therapist. A lot of therapists don't really understand trauma or dissociation or PTSD, and they tend to treat it like any other problem. And the problem with that is when you do that, you actually re-traumatize the client at worst or at best, you just aren't effective. And so EMDR is way better than the very typical kinds of inadequate treatment that is provided to people. So that's a pro.
EMDR is uh, the the worldwide organization. It, the organization is fairly organized and well put together. So clinicians, it once you get absorbed into the EMDR uh, family, so to speak, you get quick access to training and resources and consultation and stuff. So it whereas other forms of trauma therapy in my anecdotal experience don't have as robust of a community. So EMDR can feel like a little warm blanket with other, other clinicians. Also EMDR is easy to learn and it's relatively inexpensive to get training. And the last thing I'll say about EMDR is it can save people's lives. It probably already has saved hundreds of thousands of people's lives in a very, very real way. Even if the eye movements have nothing to do <laughs> with the benefit of EMDR, who cares? The point is, is that EMDR has helped people recover from their traumas, which can, in a very real way, improve people's lives, in a very real way, reduce their PTSD symptoms, their anxiety symptoms, their depression symptoms, their, their anger uh, reactions their suicidality, their homicidality. It's without a doubt clear to me that people around the globe have uh, healed them, you know, have been healed of their traumas through EMDR and the people around those traumatized people have also benefited. And so EMDR is a great thing. If you're thinking about becoming trained in it or thinking about seeking it out, go for it. I endorse. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You know you do.